we welcome in our 1320 Kings insider, uh, James Ham. James, I'm not sure if you have heard this, but Nikola Jokic is a bad dude. Um, uh, we just talked about it on the podcast. Uh, Sean and Brendan and I just got done uh, over the Kings beat. And my goodness, if we all just like been like ignoring the greatness it is Nikola Jokic. I mean, just everything he does is just so incredibly phenomenal. And the fact that it comes in the package that it comes in, uh, I, I think it's just, it, it adds to what he's able to, to accomplish. He's just stunningly good mm -hmm. and watching him like that, that three at the end of the third quarter, the 10 rebounds in like the first like five minutes of the game, the double double with like three, three minutes into the second quarter, uh, like keep, the triple doubles keep stacking up the things that he does, the way he makes his teammates better, everything about him just to me, it, it's so much fun and his personality is cool. He's just like unassuming and just kind of a, a big clumsy, like <clears throat> special kind of player. And, mm -hmm. and, and you got to love it. He, the best part of that three was Anthony Davis just gave him that. We lose, we lose in the day. Look, <laughs> like I can't do nothing but smile at you because we ain't winning if this is what's happening. Right. Right. Now he, he, he had that one and then LeBron had that when Jamal Murray hit that shot at the buzz. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron literally gave him the thumbs up like, whoa, bad boy right there. Yeah, man. At yeah. The I'd also say, yeah, the the thing that I think is amazing if you're you're watching this, I mean, because first of all, that was a really high level game. You know, Denver pulled away, but the Lakers were gritty and they stuck around. And I, I think what we saw from Denver and, and from the Lakers, but really from Denver in the way that they they were able to hold on was just the incredible shot making. And that's something that the Kings, the experience that they earned this year uh, will will help them right in, in understanding that but also just be in the moment and let it fly because it wasn't just Jokic that won that game I mean he was incredible and the second you pulled him off the floor you were in trouble but the big threes by uh Michael Porter Jr by uh by Murray um by you know uh Bruce Brown going to the basket and hammering on those guys again and again and creating the uh the different, the vertical spacing, not the, you know, the, the standard spacing, but changing the way the game was played. Like this Denver team, they've got it. They, they've got all kinds of crafty veteran, like moxie to them. And I, I, I just thought it was tremendous. The shot, the shot making is something the Kings really have to focus on, like go out there and play a bunch of basketball this summer, but take, take difficult shots. Don't just take your standard 10, threes from every spot on the floor do something crazy go wild and really push yourself during your training because that's what this level of nba basketball is about so we saw denver have you know great performances on their end do you think the lakers are looking at this like we figured something th something out now going into the rest of the series we we know how we can use Rui. We know AD can shoot his shots. We know LeBron can shoot. And if we just get um, the, the D'Angelo Russell on track, we can take advantage of this situation and we can take control of this series um, in game two. You, you think they're pretty encouraged after the way they finished that game? They can think that all they want, but the, the Nuggets, the way they come at you is just different, like all the time. You know, like Jokic is finding guys on – on back cuts, he's finding guys on full court passes. He's finding guys like in standard pick and roll situations. Like this is a really crafty team. And like, you can think that they figured it out and they, they kind of slowed them down and they, you know, they changed the, the first half versus the second half. There was definitely some positives to take away. Certainly you, you showed you could play with them. But if you even listen to Michael Malone, when they did the interview of him, like coming out of halftime, he's like, Hey, if we, if we let them have confidence, if we let them do the, if we don't play defense, they're going to catch us and we could lose this game. And that's where I, I think he's not going to allow them to just be singularly like dimensional team that, that only does one thing. Like, I think it's interesting that they were able to come up with some sort of counter, but 
you can go ahead and read Jokic's stats again. Like what kind of counter did you have? The guy had like one of the greatest triple doubles we've ever seen in the game. So in a playoff game, like as far as the numbers. So, I mean, like, yeah, you made adjustments. Some of it worked. You still lost and they still have a whole bunch of adjustments they can make as well. Uh, the other big news coming out of yesterday uh, was that the San Antonio Spurs uh, won the rights to draft Victor Wimbenyame. Mm, mm, uh, mm. We saw some changes there uh, at the top of the draft, but it'll be San Antonio uh, drafting. James, we were going through teams, <clears throat> both in the Eastern Conference and the Western, just in the lottery in general, that we thought they land the number one pick, they're contending for a playoff spot. There's a couple of teams where they land the number one pick, they might be contending for top four in their conference. San Antonio's one who still feels like they're quite a bit away, even by landing uh, Victor Wimbenyame. But uh, many in the NBA world were rejoicing at the thought of Greg Popovich uh, coaching his final years with Victor Wimbenyame. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I get why people are rejoicing. Um, I always find it weird that San Antonio always comes up, you know, like that's just someone you never want to play poker with, you know, just because they're going to beat you on dumb luck half the time. And, you know, the greatness of that franchise, it's something like 39 out of the first 42 years they made the playoffs, and then they haven't made the playoffs for like the last four straight. But every time that they're really, really bad, they get the top over one, uh, the top pick in in an incredible draft, in a draft where you're getting a legitimate franchise player. And so the David Robinson draft, the Tim Duncan draft, and now uh, women, Yama. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible. Like their luck and like, look, this is the smallest market team in, in the NBA. I believe it's possible that there might be one team that's close, but okay, San Antonio. So can... Yeah. But San Antonio has like 880,000 people. It's like the third, the size of the metropolitan area of Sacramento. So mm. this is not a, a huge, like they have to have this, this type of thing happen to them for them to continue to be great. And, you know, they've done a great job in the past of finding other guys, whether it's, you know, the Ginobili and Tony Parker or Kawhi Leonard, you know, the, the other pieces to go around the, the greatness that you have, but uh, man, it, it helps to be lucky because I mean, the Kings have been in the lottery, like all, but what, nine years they've been in the lottery and the entire time they've been in Sacramento and one time they got the number one overall pick and it was Purvis Ellison, who wasn't a legit number one. There was no legit number one in that draft. The fact that he busted out and was bad wasn't a surprise to anyone because no one was convinced that anyone at the top of that end of the draft was going to be great. And so it sometimes you got to be lucky and San Antonio seems to have that sort of like in spades. I think I... Um... I, I I didn't hear the exact number, but off the top of my head, I'm thinking of like three or four times that Charlotte has been number two. Mm. <laughs> no, I don't think they've ever been number. No, LJ was number one. Outside of LJ, I don't think they've ever been number one. They've been two like three or four times. That mm. was that was tough for them. I also heard was well, Charlotte was did, they drafted uh, Alonzo right? That was two. Was that two? Um, morning. Lamello. Lamello. No, m- morning. I'll, Oh, Alonzo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alonzo. I'm thinking Lonzo. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he was two behind Shaq. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and now they've got it was uh to, and and the number one seems to always work out with those guys because mm-hmm. um Mecca Okafor was two, I believe, behind Dwight Howard. Oof. Right. Oof. So and what it Michael K. Gilchrist was yeah. Michael K. Gilchrist, yeah. That's he was one. what three? Is that I thought, was, I thought he was two. I think he was two. Oof. Either way, Yikes. out. Yeah. Yeesh. So, and then I also heard, I don't know, I'm trying to look, are they the only team in the NBA? I'm doing a quick look. You guys, give me a second. I believe so. I believe so. Talk amongst yourselves. I think the Charlotte Hornets are the only team in the, maybe the New Orleans Pelicans, but they're the only ones that haven't been in the conference finals. Huh. Hmm. They've never been in a conference finals. And wow. And they came into the league in 89. I was going to say, what year was that? Okay, 89. Man, really? Was it really 89? Yeah. Wow. 89. How many times has 
have the Miami Heat won the championship since then? Three. They got three or maybe four. 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 four yeah, one with Dwayne Wade and was it three with LeBron? No, they or got two three. with LeBron. Yeah, two with LeBron. But yeah, yeah them and the Pelicans, uh, the only teams not to be in a conference finals ever. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Not our problem. <laughs> not great. Not our problem. It'll uh, be great when the Kings return to the conference finals next year, James. Can't wait. What do you think the, I guess this is our maybe our first official day of diving into draft talk. Do do you have a sense of uh, a, a plan for twenty four? Like I, I know there, I think there are there's stuff out there, but I do believe it's just pure speculation on what Sacramento might be interested in doing uh, with the number twenty four pick. But obviously, it's the lowest the Kings have picked in a very very long time, and uh, there's a lot of upside in this draft. Of course, Chris Murray is in this draft. Uh, I believe ESPN's first mock draft had Chris Murray at twenty four. Um, you got any sense of what the Kings might might want to do with this pick in terms of draft or trade it or? Yeah, I think all options are open. Uh, and and I also I'll tie this to a, like a larger discussion because if you are somehow able to get uh, Sasha Vazenkov to mm -hmm. sign on the dotted line, I think that also changes sort of your perspective on the twenty four pick because now you're looking at a pick where you can. You don't have to draft for need. You don't have to draft something specific. You can go true best player available. You can take a flyer at 24 if you already know that you have another rotational piece coming in. And, uh, and you know, a, a, guy, a guy who, while he'll be 28, like in November, he's still going to be a rookie. He's still, you're not going to rely on him to play like 35 minutes a night or something. Um, but I, I think your rotation is going to be pretty tight. And it's going to be tough to get minutes because I think the Kings are pushing to to be really good, uh, if not really great, this next season. And so you could take a flyer on a guy that maybe you wouldn't normally take a flyer on that mm -hmm. maybe fits a need, but a need that's two years down the road or three years down the road uh, that you know potentially could help you. The other thing you can do is you can just basically exchange it for a veteran somewhere around the league. And mm -hmm. that's something that I believe that the Kings will will seriously consider. If you can go out and either attach it to Rashawn Holmes or find a player on a three-year deal that maybe fits or doesn't quite fit, you know, like a, a Dorian Finney-Smith uh, type type trade, um, you know, something that you know a guy is going to be in your top six, seven, eight, because there's no guarantee that number 24 will ever play in the league, that they'll ever star in the league or or find rotational minutes in the league. If you can trade it for something that you know is is solid and that can give you something now and for the next two or three years that might be a better path to go and so i, I think that you know like i'm not gonna i'll dig deep into draft coverage and and figure out who the players are that i would look at around that range but i i think all bets are everything's on the table for the kings at this point just because they want to improve and they want to build this roster out a specific way as quickly as possible I was just waiting for you to say his name, James. Let's say it. Amani Bates. Let's go at 24. Amani <laughs> Bates. That's what I'm looking for right there. Swing for the fences. Amani Bates. I like Amani Bates, but I hadn't the, noticed. The I don't know how he'd fit, though. I mean, well, to your point, though, he is somebody that probably needs to put a little NBA weight on, you know, develop as, as a young man. And you'd have an opportunity with the roster that you have now. And if you're bringing Sasha over to give him that time to develop a little bit, you don't have to throw him into the fire and say, Hey, save this franchise or be the the playmaker we're looking for. Like, no, like you, you got time to do stuff. So that's why I look at it, but it's, it's so, um, so wide ranging the, the mocks that I've seen with him. Um, some have them in the low teens. Uh, some have them around where the Kings are picking. Some have them in the, second half of the second round so you know you never know but that's the type of guy that i'm looking for i told you james i'm looking for a guy that can create his own shot and put that type of pressure on on the defense we look in the playoffs you you got to have your, your spot up guys you got to have your guys that to use a baseball term go station to station but you also need your home run hitter and i think they have a lot of guys that go station to station i think they need one more guy at the at the forward spot 
that could that could that could be a big home run hitter. Yeah, I mean, he's intriguing. He's got talent. Uh, a lot of you know, he's got handles. He's got all kinds of stuff. But um, if I'm the Kings, I'm looking like you can look for that guy for sure. But I would be looking for Herb Jones. Like, give me something that's boring that's going to be in my rotation for the next decade that I know. And, and that's something I'll point out. Like uh, it's conversations that I've had with guys within the walls of, of the organization, but also just like the proof is in the way they draft. The Kings are really, really like focused on what they know about a player. They don't take flyers. And the only one that we can really point to is Jamias Ramsey. Outside of that, everyone is a mature player that's got two, three, four years in that they know exactly who they are or what they believe they can be. They don't do a lot of uh, like projections, like, hey, let's project and see what this guy could possibly be. It's always like, okay, we know who he is, and that's what we want. So whether it's Davion Mitchell or whether it's Keegan Murray or it's Tyrese Halliburton, these are all players who had established who they were before they got to the Sacramento Kings roster and they have marketable skills. They have, you know, Davion, it was like he was an excellent three point shooter, a senior year at, at Baylor, but he's also a lockdown defender. Uh, you look at Keegan Murray and, you know, his ceiling at, at Iowa was, was tremendous. And the Kings believe that the player he was at Iowa, he can be in year two, year three, somewhere down the line, the 24, uh, you know, an eight and a half, whatever it was per game. And then again, when you look at, uh, at uh, Tyrese Halliburton, it's the same thing. Like Tyrese Halliburton was exceptional at the college level. You just didn't know if it would translate, but like everything he did really, really well. He shot the ball well. He passed the ball well. He's a great rebounder at the guard position at the college level. All of these things, you just kept thinking, if it translates, they've got a shot to be really, really good. Uh, but the Kings like to draft on guys that they know. Even look at Keon Ellis. They waited until the draft was over, went out and got a four-year guy who's a 3 and D specialist. Who That's who he was in college, and that's who he was at Stockton, and that's who they think he could be down the road for the Kings. You mentioned uh, potentially trading the pick for a veteran. Do, 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 like, I'm not asking for who are they trading this pick for, more along the lines of what type of player uh, would you think? Yeah, I mean, again, I'll point back to a couple of years ago when they went and they traded Marco Bellinelli for the 22 pick in the draft. And that's because Charlotte was at a different point where they wanted a season three-point shooter because they thought that they were actually building something and the Kings wanted a draft pick. Like, there's that. The Kings will be able to find that in reverse without any question. Now, they have to draft a player for the team and then make the swap afterwards. But I, I could see the Kings looking for, again, we're talking about a 3 and D, 3 or 4. Look at how Denver's built. You know, it, you sure, you got Michael Porter Jr. and you got Murray and you've got Jokic, they're your stars. But the Kings could use an Aaron Gordon. The Kings could use a Contavious Caldwell Pope. The Kings could use a Bruce Brown. Like, these are all players that, you know, fit a need they don't take away from what you're trying to do they help you build on what you're trying to do they all shoot a high percentage from three except for gordon who's like 34 and a half percent but like the bulk of the players around Jokic are really good and you can you can look at uh like Jokic and and sabonis and like i'm not saying that sabonis is he's Jokic light right? There's not a lot of players. There's not a lot of big men in the league that can do what Jokic does. If there's one big man in the league that can do some of the things he does, it's a bonus. He's never going to be the scorer that Jokic is, but the rebounder, the passer, all of these things, you can see the players that fit around Jokic, very similar pieces would fit around Sabonis. And so just maybe use that as like a template, but you can't just have one dimensional players or players play on one end of the court this team needs to improve. They need two-way players. And there are these types of players out there that might seem like a stretch for the 24th pick in the draft, but there's no guarantees that the 24th pick will ever work out. And at least with someone like a 3 and D player, you would know exactly what you're getting. You're, you're going out and getting a player because he fits what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes, that makes perfect sense, man. I, I, I like all those guys that you named. 
I'm not saying specifically I get them, but those type of players, those are winning players. Those are guys that that you need um, on this squad. One of the guys that people think is a winning player that the Kings have been linked to in the last couple of days, just know people maybe just having some fun or maybe they know, I don't know, is Draymond Green. Do you think Draymond Green at this point in his career is a good fit? For that the didn't start this week, by the way. <laughs> That's true, too. Yeah, like me personally, I don't. I don't think it works because, I mean, are you going to ask Draymond to come off the bench for the Sacramento Kings after being a starter on a championship team in four the last 10 years? Hmm. So I don't know because he doesn't shoot the three ball at all. Um, he, he would be a nice, like complimentary passing go between defensive minded player, but is he willing to take that? Is that who he wants to be? Hmm. And maybe, but I, I just think a starting lineup with both with three players that include Fox and Sabonis and Draymond Green, that's really tough. Like you have no spacing and the Kings, uh, pace and space game has been really, really good. You know, and that's the Kings need more spacing, but they just need to find guys that also play defense. Like there are players out there that space a floor and play defense, which the Kings seem to somehow stumble upon a bunch of guys who can space the floor, but can't play defense or guys who can play defense, but can't space the floor or play offense at all. And so that's a problem. Well, Kenny will tell you that eliminates Jared Vanderbilt. Well, because he can't shoot. Well, he's had moments where he shoots. Kenny hates Jared Vanderbilt, James. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I, I can he tell you, like, four I, days now. I, I like Jared Vanderbilt a lot, but I, 10 minutes, I ain't going to get it done. Yeah, and people who watched him every day in Utah, they they thought he was over overrated. Like, I, I've talked to people there, and they're like, yeah, like, whatever you – like, sure, does he have some highlight real defensive plays? Yes but he also has like eight other plays that don't make a highlight reel because they're so bad that you can't watch it. And so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe he makes sense. Um, I don't know what his contract status is, but like, I, I think the Kings, like they, they need to be aggressive and they have an opportunity. Like I went through the books and looked at the numbers. They have an opportunity to get way under the cap and go be a massive player in the free agent market, even in the restrictive free agent market, they, they can clear up a lot of money and that's without even, figuring out a home for Rashawn Holmes. If you can figure out a home for Rashawn Holmes without taking money back, you could be a huge, huge player in the free agent market. Is Upwards that, of 40 million I mean, bucks. Is that rescinding the rights to everyone? Well, it would mean, yeah, pulling your like Larry Bird rights to a guy like uh, uh, Harrison Barnes. I mean, because yeah. Harrison Barnes, is, his cap hold is 27 and a half million, and right. he's on the books until he's not. So you can't use that cap space until you make a decision with him. And that doesn't mean that he's gone mm -hmm. because you can rescind the rights to Harrison Barnes at, at 27 and a half million. And then you can go back and sign him to a three year, you know, $36 million contract and just eat up $12 million in cap space. Like there's different ways that you can sign Harrison Barnes just because you rescind his rights as a, as a bird, you know, his bird rights. Um, doesn't mean that you can't retain him. Vanderbilt's due four point six next year. By the way, that's not a bad contract though. That's a that's a good that's a good deal for, um, you know, a, a roster a rotational piece like that. I mean, like I said, I have questions about are you closing the game with Jared Vanderbilt? But he's he's a good ball player. He's a good ball player, and he he he's a good defensive matchup for like three or four positions. So that's something that's. That's that's valuable um, to any team, especially a team that needs that type of defender like the Sacramento Kings. Yeah, I mean, I, I like Vanderbilt, but there are also players that I think are just more seasoned and that are better all around. Like if you're starting like even last at the beginning of this season with Vanderbilt and he was growing with the team, that's one thing. Uh, but I, I think that there are players that fit into what you're trying to do a little bit better. And you just have to go out and chop for them hard. And, and, and my, you, you, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. And my whole argument is, in these playoffs, he's been played off the floor because he can't shoot. He can't even make the corner three. So, 
Like that's that's my only concern with him. I like everything else that he does. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> that's my only concern. And then what about if and I like this guy and I like what he can do offensively more than Jared Vanderbilt, but we have to be real. What if you ever want to play Davion and Vanderbilt at the same time? Mm, that's tough. I mean, that's the, the challenge. I mean, you have to figure out combinations of players at work and y- you have no idea until you really get into it. Um, but, you know, they, the Kings are going to be aggressive to, to build this roster. They, they've passed the rebuild stage. They're now at a point where they got to a certain point, uh, you know, a certain level in the playoffs and they want to go to a different level. They know that that requires them to improve, you know, their rotation. It does. Like experience is one thing. And that's great, but there's more than experience that you need. You need more talent. You need two-way players. You need more shooting. You need a shot blocker. You need athleticism. This team lacks, and I think that they're going to be aggressive. Uh, We'll come back. We'll talk more uh, about the Kings draft positioning. We'll talk more NBA basketball with our 1320 Kings insider, James Ham with Dilo McCasey, brought to you by Sky River Casino. Returns here on Sacramento Sports Leader. ESPN 1320. I mentioned this. Are you uh, out of here after the show, by the way? Yeah, there you go. I mentioned this yesterday a little bit. Didn't talk about it. Did you ever see the Jerry Springer situation? No. So I never Jerry, went back to it. So Jerry um, had a video with his will mm-hmm. that he was playing for, for his kids or whatever. So they, they were all on Zoom or whatever. And he's talking about it and he gets into – how he had two kids uh, illegitimately outside of his marriage and they were both black. He had them with a black woman and his wife was like, you have to cut off all relationships with them or whatever else. I'm telling the media, I'm divorcing you. I'm taking you for everything you own. And he was talked about, he's like, yeah, I, I did it. I was scared. I was a coward. Um, I shouldn't have done that as a father or whatever the case may be. So when it got time to, talk about who's getting what i think he has two kids in the marriage Mm -hmm. he told the two kids he said you guys will get my house um and you'll have everything that's in this house you'll get my house and the two black kids were on the zoom too and he said to you guys i leave you my entire estate Mm. and you guys can do whatever you want with it if you want to whatever you want to do with it but i leave you guys my estate and the two kids in the marriage, you guys can get the house, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want. But oh, they're saying it was a, a fake, Casey. Really? They said it was a script for a stage play. Oh, just saying, they got I'm me. Just, if that's if that's saying. if that's true, they got me. <laughs> Did I ever tell you guys that a guy that was, was on my Jerry little league Springer too? Yeah, a guy mm. on my little league team was well, on Jerry Springer that, one day. Forget that whole story. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are the fucking worst with this. I'm gonna tell you that right now. <laughs> you are this, the worst. This is just like when Demar Derozan well, no, got two years ninety this was, mil. This was all they got a lot of people. This no, was I all over it. Twitter. No, I see it. Yeah, it was like all it. I saw it on like six different accounts that day, and everybody's like, "Oh man, check this out." Damn, they I got thought that was all. Okay. Right. <laughs> they got us all with that one. Did I ever tell you guys a story? I was watching Jerry Springer one morning and a dude that played on my little league team was on Jerry Springer <laughs> and his, his wife, <laughs> this is nuts. His wife was sleeping with her own sister. And that was why they were on Springer to like hash it out. And I'm like, Oh man. Like I knew that he graduated. Well, he might not have graduated with me, but I went to school with him. I went to high school with him. I went to junior high with him. He's on my little league team. And then here he is on Jerry Springer with some crazy story, which I don't know if it was real or not. I'm guessing it wasn't real. But, Clip from yeah. Virtual Play tricks Twitter. Man. Thought he was really reading his will. Got us all. Well, got me and a few other people. I ain't going to say it's all. Maybe some people already knew. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny, you, Kenny is what's wrong with the internet? Damn it. <laughs> who, I was like, this is a hell of a story. Who, who watches that video and sees it all on their time? I'm like, nah. I'm going to do some more research. I think this is fake. Man, you've had a bad week on the internet. I'm going to tell you that. Did you retweet this? No. Okay. I just watched the video. <laughs> Did you retweet this? <laughs> uh, okay. First of all, God damn it, you guys. He had one wife. 
He didn't Jerry. have two. He was he, he married one woman in 1973. Was been with her. I I thought that's what he said in the video. He said his second wife in the video or something. But no, that's not a real video. <laughs> no, but I'm saying. He's, he's, the, Did you, what, didn't you just say his, his? He had a black wife. No, he had a he had a, they they were saying he was outside of the marriage. Yeah, like, see, there it is, right oh. there from Russell. Yeah, this is Kenny watching this video on his new iPhone. <laughs> Wouldn't happen on my old phone. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a new phone? No. No. Phone. no. <laughs> <laughs> no we don't need to go down that trail again. Man, really filming us with a on IG Live <laughs> with a tiny little Palm Pilot in his hand. <laughs> Did you watch uh, Back to the Future? One. No. <laughs> my uh, one we found is. It. Did I tell you we, we found it on two? My son was started watching it. It's fun. I'm it's my it. wife's favorite Probably movies. Over the Probably watch it over the weekend. Yeah. Those are my wife's favorite movies. Oh, Jerry. Oh, Jerry's brother. Yeah, I'm a Back to the Future fan for sure. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> That's <laughs> even if it's fake, we'll just tell that story still. And you know what the you know what the you know what the worst part about all of this is? Mm. It's our Twitter that fell for it. <laughs> like if you search Jerry Springer, and oh, he was all over. All <laughs> Black like, Twitter, let's go, erupted. let's go. <laughs> this is so out of line. Uh, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> Just awful. That's funny. Oh, Lizzie yeah. thinks I should have a movie vlog. James is probably well. James said he worked at a video store and seen a bunch of. Movies. What was the store you were? It wasn't Hollywood Video. What was it? No, no. When I was, I, I worked at a video stop in uh, oh, in Cedar on. Ridge. <laughs> Jesse's so excited about his damn Eastern Conference Finals. I almost forgot. Hey, we got a show to do, guys. <laughs> We got a show to do, guys. Uh, we appreciate you for being with us. Hey, guys. James. Tales of Kenny's uh, internet behavior oh, just took over the last they commercial got us, break. Hey, they got us all. They got us all. Not all they of us. us. Not all of us. <laughs> they got us all on that one. That is all one to believe on that one. Um, uh, well, let me ask James a, a real question. Can we just ish. follow this up just real quick? Mm. For those that are listening. The Jerry Springer story <laughs> is not real. PSA. Just, just, a, just a quick note. <laughs> From now on, when you see a story just outrate, just one quick Google search. <laughs> Keep it moving. PSA. Um, something we did talk about, James, and I want to ask you about it because you got knowledge of all things Sacramento. You know, there's the story kind of floating out there that the NHL, you know, in a roundabout way may have interest in Sacramento. We know Vivek has interest in the Ottawa Senators and um, who knows if he gets that, whatever the case may be. The Ottawa centers wouldn't be the one moving here. It'd be uh, the Coyotes, but whatever. NHL possibly in Sacramento would be a great thing. If you could choose between one, you can get a Major League Baseball team or an NHL team here in Sacramento. Which one would you choose? Oh, that's not even a discussion. Yeah, I, I would want baseball here without any question. Sacramento would be a great spot for baseball. Like the weather's amazing for baseball. Uh, like I, I think this would be a it's a baseball town for sure. Like when the River Cats were good and really focused on, you know, winning PCL championships and stuff like that. Like it was a hot ticket. There was always a ton of people out there. Uh, I, I fully think this is a baseball town, and I think you could, like, if the Vivek was like went out and called his friend John Fisher and said, hey, can we work out a deal? Let's get the A's to Sacramento. That would be tremendous. Um, because the rest of it, I don't like relocation. I'm someone who had to cover relocation, who did a documentary on relocation, who went to city council meetings for two years, uh, who went to board of governors meetings. Like, like relocation is nasty and it's horrible. And I feel for, for uh, the fans of cities that lose a team. And... So for the Kings to to be somebody who, you know, like fought to stay alive 
and then to go out and like try to poach somebody else's team. I'm not really down for that. Uh, like the, the situation in Arizona looks in Tempe, like they just can't get anything built. And if the fans, if there aren't fans there, that's one thing. But like, if you were to move the A's from Oakland to Sacramento, there would still be a tremendous amount of A's fans at every single game from Oakland. Like that's not really relocating. It's, it's finding a new city. That's really like a city adjacent almost, you know, where you can still go to games like you move them to Las Vegas, that's not the same thing. And so, uh, yeah, like I, I would say baseball, uh, like a hundred out of a hundred times. Like I, I've never watched a hockey game from start to finish. I also know that they had an opportunity when they're building Golden One to make it into a multi-use stadium for both hockey and basketball, and they chose not to. And so, in order to do that, they would have to retrofit a bunch of stuff and change a lot of things about what they've they've built here for basketball. And I don't know that number one, you can really like build it for hockey, but also that like that there's that much of a hunger for it here. I, I mean, San Jose, it's done perfectly fine, but I just don't know that there's that big of a hunger for for hockey in Sacramento. I feel like hockey would be a blast here. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would prefer an MLS team to four. Well, four, and, and that's yeah. and, that, and and Jesse brought that point up earlier is where would you rank MLS and all of this? And I, I, I think this city has already shown what MLS – means to them and that should be above everything Mm -hmm. i think hockey would be a blast i I have no issue with baseball at all um but mls above all else for sure yeah i also i don't want to see i don't want to see a team relocate to sacramento Mm -hmm. i think that would be hypocritical you know you're you're a team a city that you know fought now again if there's a team that's they're leaving. There's no chance. They're looking for somewhere else to go because they can't get whatever built. That's what, that's what Phoenix feels like. That's, that's what Phoenix feels like. This doesn't feel like poaching or, or or anything like that. This, this feels like they're, they're done. And maybe, you know, some of it to their own doing, but they're, they're done in that city. Yeah. No, it it sounds like it. And the surrounding cities, apparently. (laughs) Well, that and, Man, if I'm like, you don't want a different owner. Yeah, you don't want that owner coming in here and relocating a team. You want to get rid of whatever's ailing that franchise, Mm -hmm. which is, again, why this situation with the Oakland A's is so dramatic. Like, John Fisher is a horrific owner. He's Mm -hmm. the worst owner that there there is. He's got tons of money. He's just greedy and and just bad. He, He has bad intentions, and he's a horrible steward for a franchise. And why would you want that if you're Las Vegas? If I'm Las Vegas, I'm telling Major League Baseball, like, look, we'll come up with the 500 million or the 750 million, whatever it is you want. But we don't want that guy. So either let a local owner buy it here or give us expansion because we don't want to mess with that guy because straight up, that guy's a loser. When it comes to to professional ownership, he's flat out just a loser. And you don't want that guy around. I mean, that's like the Maloofs are not allowed to to be NBA owners again. Like nobody wants them around. The fact that they were able to get an NHL part owner of an NHL hockey team, that was a stretch too. A lot of people weren't happy about that. Hmm. So, I mean, they, they proved to be poor stewards of a franchise. And there's no reason why you would think that they would be better somewhere else. Because I, I have a Fisher's not going to be better. Someone, I mean, look what he's already doing. He's switching like locations from one week to the next, looking for five hundred million bucks from city council. It's crazy. Just once, James. I wish you would say how you feel about John Fisher. Just, <laughs> just once, man. I saw, I saw a report. This was somebody that. This wasn't an internet story. Okay. I was here really nervous. I'm really nervous uh, now. When you I am too. <laughs> they, did, they did some kind of study where they they said the A's are guaranteeing like 2.5 billion dollars in revenue uh-huh. a year to, from the uh, stadium, and I guess somebody did the math and they said if they got if they sold out that stadium for every game to get 2.5 billion or whatever for a year, they'd have to sell 30,800 tickets a game. 
it's only supposed to be a 30,000 seat stadium. So <laughs> he's already he's already trying to pull the wool over somebody's eye. Well, that and on top of it, the like Trump the school of numbers. <laughs> yes. They want to go to a like they want a plot of land where they can have all this other development, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not what the new like the Tropicana. I don't know if you saw that. That's like mm-hmm. Like in the backside of a uh, off the strip, it's just like mm. not a great location at all. So yeah. uh, very very strange, like what they're trying to do there, and it's it's just it reeks of desperation and like Major League Baseball pushing an envelope, saying, "Okay, look, we we went down this path. You guys got to figure it out," and That's they're smart. not figuring it out yet. So I'm hoping that uh, that Las Vegas turns them down and says, "No, we're not giving you the money." And if that yeah. happens, all bets are off. Like who knows where they end up. As we transition back to the NBA here, I I was thinking of something during the break when you were talking about uh, the draft. And this is it's a conversation that comes up every year. It's a conversation that came up as recently as last year, but it has a completely different context with the Sacramento Kings drafting at 24. We talked about we were talked about in the veteran sense. If you if you uh, were able to move this pick, what type of veteran would you be looking for? What type of player would you be looking for? Well, at 24, what would you be looking for? Is this a best player available? Is this a position? Is it low enough to where, like, I think I can fill a really specific need here uh, at 24? It really does depend on what the rest of your offseason plans are. So, again, if you have Sasha Vizenkov, like, and you know you have him, and, like, you're not going to be able to sign him until after July 1st, so it doesn't really matter what, what you can do right now versus like, you can't sign him until after July 1st, but if you know, you have him, I think it totally changes how you approach the draft because you're looking at a player that you're probably getting on a two or a three year contract. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to have him here. So would I go out and fill up a roster spot with another, you know, that type like stretch four, or do I go look for, like the shot blocker version, or do I look for just a straight up defensive player that maybe has some raw offensive skills? Like, I think it does change how you approach the draft, but I'll go back to like, look at their draft strategy, how they've done it each and every year. It's very specific. Like you, you get mature seasoned players that fill a role. Now it doesn't mean that'll be the same. If, if you think that this roster is going to be pretty complete, like if you think you're going to not only, you know, bring back Fox and Sabonis and, Herter and um, you know Malik and Keegan and and Davion and then you're looking at like the next tier like what happens with Harrison or you know but you're already pretty set in most of your rotation so the 24th pick to me it either goes to buying a rotational piece uh, a veteran rotational piece or it goes to like a a player that you think that you project that could be something down the road, not this next year, or maybe even the year after someone that might play in Stockton quite a bit. Someone that, you know, will be a good practice player to have, but something different than what you already have. You said something there that um, you could, maybe you could help me with. Why, why do the Kings have to wait until July 1st to bring Sasha over when he's under their club control? Um, because the start of the NBA season, it, like the calendar resets, their yearly calendar resets on July 1st. So that's mm-hmm. that's the beginning of free agency. That's the beginning of the NBA's new fiscal calendar year. So they couldn't even like like tomorrow announce like, yeah, he's coming over. They couldn't even say that it would have to be like hush hush or. No, uh, what we could see is a a report that the Kings have you know, you know, landed, like it, it looks like the Kings have landed or the Kings are in agreement on principle for a, a contract with Sasha Vizenkov that he's coming over. We could see that stuff, but chances are that none of that will happen for a little while. He's got to get through his playoffs, whatever that means. Then he's got to make a tough decision. Like he's the one, like again, Sean Cunningham has reported he's is 90% that he's coming over. And you can say 90%, but I'll say that the 10% is 100% of everything. That 10% is whether Sasha wants to leave the comforts of Europe where he's a superstar and beloved and winning MVPs to go to Sacramento where he's going to be a role player. And that's going to be a big question for him. And it's possible that he says, 
at the end, like, I don't think I, I will do it. I mean, the Kings drafted, uh, was it Dejan Rodriguez in like 1994, mm-hmm. 95? And they just renounced his rights or something like two years ago or something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and <laughs> that dude was flat out a baller. Yeah. Talking about playing in, the long game. <laughs> yeah. He was incredible. Yeah. I heard Incredible he was in Europe. truth. Like there was a guy mm-hmm. that I know that played that played against him over there, and they're like, "Nah, he was amazing." Yeah, never yeah. wanted to come over. No, he was spectacular, and he just kept turning it down. And not all players come over and have a great time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my point with you with Sasha is, if you can get him in the you know the four to six million dollar range, you know, there's Davis Bertons running around out there making eighteen million dollars a year, basically has the same skill set. You know, we're talking about an a spectacular shooting power forward, a six foot nine dude with a quick release that will be able to get his shot off without any question at the NBA level. Mm-hmm. He'll be a third or fourth option, not in a starting group, but a third or fourth option on the floor at all times, and a dude who can absolutely put the ball in the basket. And so, like, this is this is a player that, like, it he could be a very very good like money ball player. And, you know, if you're going to build out your roster and you know that you already have like 15 to 16 million committed to Kevin Herter for the, the next four years, you've got um, big money committed to, to De'Aaron Fox, big money committed to Sabonis coming up. Um, and, you know, all of these mechanisms that are in place where these guys are making a ton of money, having guys like this that are like very good, uh, like bargain basement players that that actually have a functional skill like shooting and floor spacing um then this is the way you build a really quality high quality team do you know what sasha makes now yeah he makes like i think it's like 1.5 uh euro like 1.5 million euro and that translates to like 1.6 million in u.s and then next season, I believe he his contract bumps up to two million for next season, which is like two point one something in in U.S. terms. So he doesn't make a ton of money there. And, so which he's is, making about the same, a little here, more. Probably. Yeah, what, here. Yeah. No, no. Well, see what happened last season yeah. is that the Kings carved out a. Okay, so let me get like really quickly technical with. Okay, so if you have a mid level exception. A mid-level mm-hmm. exception is is three years, and I think you can even go four years with a mid-level, right? A biannual exception, the ma- the maximum you can go is is two years. Uh, the room exception, the maximum you can go is two years. So what the Kings did was they carved out like a, a league minimum salary into their MLE, their mid-level exception, so they could do a longer than two-year uh, contract with Sasha. They were trying to do a three-year deal with Sasha where – it was like 1.64 and then 2.2 and then 2.8 million over the three years. So he would have made like roughly like six or 7 million. It was way more than what he was going to make in Europe, but it also does things like give the Kings Larry bird rights to him when he's done with his first contract. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of these mechanisms and he, I believe he would still be a restricted free agent uh, because he still falls under rookie scale and all that. Like there's a bunch of complexities to all of this, but he turned that down. He wanted the the biannual exception or his agent wanted the biannual exception, which was roughly right around $4 million. But again, only a two-year deal. So like there's all of these different things that the Kings are working with. And some of it's like super complex. Like if they renounce the rights to everybody and, and get $34 million in cap space, they can spend all of that cap space. And once it's all gone, they can use the room exception, which is $7.8 million and they can bring him over as part of the room exception. Uh, so again, that and that's how with the Sasha Kings and did. Kyrie Irving. Yeah, <laughs> that's so, what that's James Ham's plan for Kyrie and <laughs> Sasha right there. Yeah, and and, and uh, someone Alex here in the chat says, "Why is Matina there?" Um, I wrote on this in the Kings beat, and you guys should read the article I wrote about Sasha particularly. Like having Matina there is spectacular. Like mm-hmm. anyone who like you guys can think of. You Matina, gotta, however you want, right? You've got to stop getting triggered by her name, guys. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you, really you, you do. But what you also have to understand is that Matina is the person who flew to Greece and got Pesha Stoyakovich out of his contract in Greece and to sign 
he was drafted in 96. He came over for the 98, 99 lockout shortened season. She was the one who accomplished that Mm -hmm. in 2000 when they drafted Hito Turkoglu. She's the one that went over and negotiated his contract to get him out of his contract in Turkey. And he had to pay his own buyout in that situation. And Hito lived at Matina's house, his rookie season, because this is what, because he had very little money because he had to pay his own buyout. So Hito lived in a, like a, like an apartment on the backside of Matina's house when he was a rookie uh, until he got, he started getting enough money to go get his own place and everything. So like, look, having Matina there means that the Kings mean business. The first she she's going to be dealing with people from Greece because he plays for Olympiacos. Uh, it's Matina Kalakotronis. She speaks fluent Greece, uh, Greek. Like this is the perfect person to have there. So when you send Mike Brown, that's one thing to send the COO of the Kings uh, who can negotiate a contract. That's a pretty big deal. So I, I hope people understand that like there's some people like she's not like the team, boogeyman here. Like the she, team won she, 48 yeah. games last year, <laughs> got coach of the year, clutch player of the year, two all NBA players, two all stars. And you're still triggered by her name. <laughs> and and Mark fun. Wong points out she's an attorney. Yes, she's an attorney. She also taught law school at McGeorge, um, taught sports law at, at, at McGeorge, like, Matina is a very, very smart woman and a, an ally in this situation for sure. Matina went over to Sasha and said, I'm about 98% sure I could get you out of this contract. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, his buyout is going to be about five, uh, about 1.5 million. The Kings can pick up like 875 of that. <laughs> but the other like 625,000, that's on Sasha. So whatever <laughs> he makes in his first contract, the Kings can actually just send part of the money over. I knew Dave would get that one. Matina, Matina. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, you get it's a wrong. I'd walk, I walk over, Matina walks over to Sasha, like, buddy, you're 27. <laughs> At 28, all you're going to be asking is what if. <laughs> you're going to want to take this opportunity now. You don't want to take this opportunity <laughs> now, buddy, because you're. You're uh you're you're about two and a half years away from being old. Uh so 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 get in here and and get working. Yeah. And he's been a pro for 12 years. Yeah, that's that's, that's the crazy part about the those those players over it's there. Time. Like the, yeah. <laughs> it's time, sir. Right. Like, hey, yeah. Quick question, James. Do you think um just a, a gut feeling, do you think the Kings make all their picks in this draft? I'm sure I'll ask you again, but as of no. today, you think they make all their picks? I'm not convinced they make any of them. Uh, I do think, you know, they have two second round picks. They have an early and then they have a late. Um, I think they'll at least use one of those because uh, I believe the NBA bumped up the, um, you can have up to three. Am I wrong? That this coming in the new CBA, you can have three two ways players. So mm. you might use them both. So why not? you know, draft players that you really want. But then again, you know, they like what they found last year with Keon Ellis uh, doing an undrafted thing as, as a two-way player. And um, it is, again, as long as you're being logical about the situation, you can take a flyer, a flyer on one guy and then a really solid, uh, you know, college veteran that knows who he is. And maybe you come across, you know, a player that can steal you 30 games at some point in the next two years. Make sure you check out the kingsbeat.com. Become a premium subscriber over there. Make sure you head over to the Kingsbeat YouTube channel as well as that new podcast. I'm sure will drop here uh, in just a heartbeat. If you listen-